Welcome to PetX Talks, pet experts empowering pet parents. Pet parents deserve expert knowledge and inspiration directly from pet experts. The topics will range from history to innovation, from health to safety, from training to philosophy, and from experiences to inspiration. The pet experts range from veterinarians to researchers, authors to historians, organizations to individuals, and anyone with important information and inspiration for the pet world. We all want to do the best we can for our pets and the pet world. PetX Talks, the experts who give them, and the topics they share will help us achieve that. Are you ready to be empowered? Then join us for a PetX Talk. This PetX Talk is brought to you by Pet World Media Group, your partner in all things pet media. Additional funding and considerations provided by Pet World Insider, Dogwise, and Life is Pawfect. I'm Kate Kelly, and I'm here from America Comes Alive. I do a regular series of true stories of American dogs, and today I'm here to tell you about how the first seeing eye dog was brought to the United States in 1928. But before we get into the story, I need to set up a, a little bit of background. Think about the fact that today, we go into a major city, we see guide dogs everywhere. They're in movie theaters, they're in subways, they're in restaurants with us. They are very much a, an accepted part of the fabric of American life. As a result, we rarely stop and think about the fact that there was a time before 1928 when these dogs were not acceptable ar around here. They were not used in that way. So what did people who were sightless do if they lived in America in the early 1900s? Well, if you had very little money, then you were very likely to have to rely on a family member. They would either run errands for you and bring something home to you, or if you needed to go someplace, you would have to wait until they had time to actually take you to town. Now, if you had a little bit more money, you could hire a young boy who might guide you around on the errands you needed to do, but young boys then, young boys now, same problem. Some are terrific and reliable, some are not so reliable, or they walk too fast. They're, they're not exactly the most agreeable employees to have to work with under those circumstances. So as a result, if you had no sight before 1928, you were very much marginalized. So we get to the story of the arrival of the first seeing eye dogs by meeting two individuals. The first is a woman named Dorothy Harrison Eustace, who was the trainer of the first seeing eye dog to be brought here. And the second person is a young man named Morris Frank. He lived in Nashville, Tennessee, and we'll hear more about him. But to, to begin with, we'll talk about Dorothy. Dorothy was born in 1886. She was born into a prominent Philadelphia family, and she also married very well. She married a man who was, had a very successful business. They decided to buy a farm in Vermont, had two children, and one of their hobbies was that they decided to, to take on a herd of cattle, and they became very interested in the breeding process of these cows. Like, how could you breed the cows together in such a way that you could produce more milk? So that was something that they had as an active hobby that they shared together. Sadly, her husband contracted typhoid fever and died shortly after that. So Dorothy was left a widow with two children, and she had few options at that point. So she sold the farm and moved back to Philadelphia where she could be closer to her family. Over time, she met another gentleman by the name of George Eustace. They married, and George wanted to make their life together in Switzerland. So he moved Dorothy and her kids over to Switzerland, where they set up a nice lifestyle. Now, something we also wouldn't acknowledge is the fact that German Shepherds really were not a familiar dog in the United States. They were common in Europe, but one of the first sites that Dorothy gets excited about in her new home in Switzerland is the sight of this German Shepherd dog. She just thinks they're wonderful. She hears about their intelligence, she hears about their reliability, and she thinks back to what she learned about cattle breeding. And her idea is to think about ways to breed these dogs in such a way that they become more intelligent and more reliable. Now, if you're breeding wonderful dogs, one of the things you need is well-trained wonderful dogs. So she hires a trainer, a fellow named Elliot Humphrey. He was a well-known animal trainer 
at that time, but he is a name you hear throughout history because he went on to do a great deal of the training of canines in, in World War II. So he's a name that you'll hear throughout. But he starts out with Dorothy working with these dogs and just working on all different types of discipline and training them. Now, Dorothy's program is, is heard about by people all over you know, the, the dog world, and it, it, the world word filters back to the United States. An editor at the Saturday Evening Post hears about the program she's running, and they write her a letter, and they ask her, please write an article for us about what it is you're doing with the dogs. Well, Dorothy, of course, says yes, but she has another plan. What she doesn't tell them is she doesn't want to write about her program. She's been observing a program up in Potsdam, Germany that interests her more than what she's actually doing. Now, to set, set the time, this is the early 1920s, one of the effects that everybody who, all, all the countries who fought in World War I have had is that the damage to soldiers from mustard gas often resulted in the men losing their vision. So they were ending up with a good number of soldiers who survived their war injuries but had no sight. And one of the things they were doing in Potsdam, Germany, was using these German shepherd dogs in order to work with the, the men so that they could use them as guide dogs. Dorothy was fascinated by this possibility. She goes up, she observes the program long enough to get her article, sends her article to the Saturday Evening Post. It's published in November 5th, 1927, and that article was going to change the lives of people without sight in America forever. But now in order to bring about change, you have to have the person who becomes changed as a result. And that brings us to Nashville, Tennessee, and Morris Frank. Morris Frank is the son of a well-to-do uh, insurance man in Nashville. He's 20 years old. He lost his vision, a one, one eye he lost when he, in a childhood accident. A few years later, when he was 16, he was in a boxing match, and he lost his, uh, the sight out of his other eye. So clearly, this is a young man who's intelligent. He knows he has his whole life ahead of him, and yet he has no vision and he is marginalized. Well, one of the customs that he and his father had established was the fact that when his father would come home from work, he would read to Morris from the newspaper or from magazines that had come. So in November of 1927, he's reading to Morris from the Saturday Evening Post, and they come upon the article that Dorothy has written. Morris has one response to this article, and that is, I must have one of these dogs. Well, his father is certainly not going to argue with that. He thinks it's a great idea, too. So the two of them sit down. They write a letter to Dorothy explaining why he should have this dog, how he would like to be trained, and, and promising that if he is trained by Dorothy, he will bring the dog back to show people in the United States that a man without sight can actually live independently. Now, Morris and his father make one additional promise, and that is if Dorothy will do this, they will help Dorothy establish a school for seeing eye dogs here in the United States. Dorothy gets this letter, and wow, these are both offers that she can't afford to refuse. She accepts, asks Morris to journey to, to Switzerland, and she and Elliot Humphrey get busy working with a couple of dogs with what they think he will need in terms of, uh, what Morris will need in terms of uh, using the dog as a guide dog. There's only one hurdle. We've got to get Morris from the United States to Switzerland. His family arranges passage for him on a ship, and the only thing is that the captain is quite concerned about having a sightless man on board his ship. So they classify Morris Frank as a package. They assign him a stateroom, but he is told that he cannot leave his stateroom unless someone in, uh, on the staff of the ship has time to stop by and pick him up to take him where he wants to go. So clearly his, his journey across is a humiliating and very disturbing way to be treated as a human being. He's met by Dorothy, they travel to, to Switzerland, and they begin the training. Now, Dorothy and, and the trainer, Elliot, have worked with two different dogs. This is a new process for them, and they're not sure which dog would be best with working with Morris. And the dog that he does best with is a dog named Kiss. 
Morris is 20 years old. He is not going back to the United States with a dog named Kiss. So he renames the dog Buddy. And every subsequent guide dog he had after that was Buddy. So, so that became his name for, forever. In the meantime, they decide that Morris is ready to go back to the United States. They arrange passage for him across the Atlantic. Uh, Dorothy takes him to the shipboard get it to see that he and Buddy get onto the ship okay, and she leaves him with a very stern warning. And she says, Morris, if people won't let you into restaurants, hotels, and on different types of transportation, Buddy will do you no good. So as you see, 1928 was just like today. You couldn't just waltz into someplace with a dog. It was going to be an issue wherever he went, and that was his task to make it acceptable. So, so Buddy arrives, remembering Dorothy's stern warning, and the first thing he has become aware of is the fact that the media is there to greet him. He knows that the program has been written about and that he's going to be greeted by reporters. What he's surprised at is the number of reporters, and the first hurdle he and Buddy have to get over is the fact that Buddy needs to lead him through the throng of reporters. So they make that first challenge and, and get through the reporters all right. And one of the reporters standing in the back calls out to him and says, hey, Morris, let me see you if you can get that dog to get you across West Street. OK, West Street is a street in downtown Manhattan. It's just like West Street is today. It's different kinds of traffic. It's different kinds of, of conveyances, but just as hectic. Lots of loading and unloading, lots of men, lots of shouting, lots of, of human traffic. And Morris is thinking, what in our background trained Buddy to get me across such a busy street? But he's thinking of, of what Dorothy has sent him across to do, and he thinks the only thing he can do is try. So he assesses the situation, gives Buddy the command, and Buddy successfully navigates him across West Street. And then they go on to their destination for that day. Well, that night, he and Buddy go out to the telegraph office, and they send Dorothy a telegram, and it says, success. So they had accomplished that very first day, and that was wonderful. Now, just a, a, about six weeks later, Dorothy comes over to the United States. She's coming with three additional dogs, and she stops in New York City to give a few speeches on, on what her program is and what she's doing. And then she and the dogs continue on down to Nashville at the site that they had planned to do the first school. They start the school called the Seeing Eye School. And a couple of years later, Dorothy really wants a permanent home and a, a bigger space. So she buys property up in New Jersey. And the Seeing Eye School still exists, still exists in New Jersey, and is still a major provider of seeing eye dogs today. So certainly, the school that Morris and Dorothy started continues on and is a very good thing. So, so we get Dorothy successfully through that. Now, Morris also maintains his con connection with Dorothy and with the school, but he continues to travel. They travel all over the place. And in 1936, we're very lucky because he did an interview with the New York Times, at which point we have documentation of what was going on at that time. We know that 250 dogs had been placed with people who had no vision in the United States, and that by that time, uh, Morris and Buddy had logged 50,000 miles on foot, on trolley, on subway, you know, by car, by boat, everything you can think of, he's done everything. We get to a couple of years later in 1938, and one of the issues that every person with a service dog must deal with is the fact that the dog gets tired and needs to be retired before your life is over. So Morris is reckoning with the fact that he's going to have to let Buddy One retire. But he has one more mission that he wants to accomplish while he still has this Buddy. The two of them have never flown on a commercial airline together. He contacts United Airlines, they rewrite their rules, and on May 16, 1938, Morris and, and Buddy fly from Chicago to Newark successfully, together in the, in the cabin of the passenger jet. So at that point, Buddy settles into a new home very near the school. He's left to live out the rest of his life in comfortable retirement. 
Morris picks up another dog, Buddy Two, and that dog becomes as famous as Buddy One because Morris continues traveling and introducing the dog to all different types of society and different places. So he continued on with his very important mission and, and teaching the life-changing aspect of having, uh, having a guide dog. Now, no one said better than Morris what it meant to him. And he was talking about Buddy One with this particular quote, but he said, Buddy delivered to me the divine gift of freedom. And it really doesn't get better than that. Hi, we're back here with Kate Kelly from America Comes Alive. And she just did her wonderful PEDX talk, the story of America's first seeing eye dog. Kate, it is remarkable that this is just recent history. From where we started to where we've come, that is a tremendous journey. Exactly, if you lived 100 years ago and had any kind of disability, whether it was vision or, or some physical incapacity, you were totally marginalized. There was no accommodation for you in any way. There were no guide dogs, there was just nothing. And you were pretty much reliant upon your family members to help you out or get you around. It would have been a very poor existence. Certainly a challenge. And when we talk about challenges, you shared some of the challenges of just getting this going, and we've certainly come a long way, but there's still such a long way to go. Well, and I was very interested. There are a couple of things that come to mind. One is the fact that I interviewed the current head of the Seeing Eye School, which still exists, and I said, you know, how necessary are guide dogs now where there's so much technology to help out and he said they are more necessary than ever and he said one of the biggest challenges that they've had are hybrid cars because a car at rest that seems to be at rest isn't necessarily a car that is not going to move so they've had to work with the dogs in assessing any danger from a, a car that is just sitting there the, the the motor is not running so that they know that that's still something that they have to be very watchful for to avoid having an accident. So we have that challenge, which is just still needing these dogs in all sorts of capacities. But we also have the challenge of needing more service dogs in the workplace. They're being used now for stability dogs, for dealing with PTSD, for all types of sources of services that we can only imagine diabetic dogs I mean you name it they've come up with a way to train a dog for it so then you bring your dog to the workplace the ADA ruling of 1990 permits it but then you've got a certain number of co-workers who are saying what about me I have allergies so there's a, a tension now that's being set up and some workplaces are working it out so that the person with the dog comes in one entrance you know, a perfectly normal, good entrance, and the person with the dog allergies comes in a different way, and they use an air purifier in the area where the, uh, you know, the dog is to try to make sure that the hair doesn't spread. Now, I also have to say that for all those people who are upset about dog allergies and in the workplace, there are a lot of coworkers who are perfectly thrilled to stop by, and if the dog isn't working, to pet it and give it a lot of attention, because there are a lot of benefits to having these dogs in the workplace. Well, we've also seen more and more organizations coming to the forefront to assist in these endeavors. Let's talk about that for a second. Yes, and the Seeing Eye is just one school. I mean, there are many here out here in California. There are schools everywhere. Canines for Independence is another big one. And there, those places, the Seeing Eye is limited to visually impaired people. But these other places are training dogs for all sorts of different kinds of use and you know the sky's the limit. There's a place up in Northern California where they're teaching the dogs to read. I want to get up there at some point. <laughs> well we certainly want to thank Kate Kelly for that wonderful talk and we thank all of you for joining us here on PetX Talks. Thank you for joining us for this PetX Talk. To learn more information about Kate Kelly visit America Comes Alive Dot com. Funding for PetX Talks is provided by Pet World Media Group, your partner in all things pet media. Additional funding and considerations for PetX Talks is provided by Pet World Insider, taking you inside the world of pets. Visit 
PetWorldInsider.com for more radio interviews and expert articles and videos. DogWise Publishing, all things dog. For all of your dog book needs, visit DogWise.com. Life is Perfect, a gift book. A whimsical collection of themed dog portraits accompanied by wit and wisdom by the photographer. Visit thepotographer.com. For more information and other excellent PetX Talks, visit PetXTalks.com. This has been a Pet World Media Group production.